Marvel Comics has become an absolute parody of social justice. I'll show you exactly what I mean right from the get-go. So this is a comic from the 1990s called New Warriors. I never read Marvel during the 1990s because I wasn't a filthy normie. I, I read interesting and edgy things like Toxic, 2000 AD and Alien vs Predator. But apparently a lot of people did read this and I'm sure it was very good. I'm sure they enjoyed it because as you can see, it's traditional Marvel fare. Now the first thing we notice is that all of the characters are very gendered. The men very much look like men, and the women very much look like women. And not only that, they are in peak physical condition. This is a staple for comic books, but especially Marvel, where the, the people in them look amazing. They, their bodies are the ideal of what a human body can look like. Well, I mean, not all of them. And so this is going to become part of the, I don't know, hypocrisy part of it. But, I mean, there's some famous, you know, quite a few famous... Um, um, characters that aren't these um, like models and idealized images and stuff you know but uh, yeah it's he's gonna get in this here so I'll let go here but yeah it's really yeah the very gendered bit you know there's characters all the different things like you know we could pick up um, you know something like um, the, the Great Lakes Adven uh, Avengers or whatever with uh, Big Bertha and stuff like that. I wonder what he would think about that character that's been around for, what was it, 30 years now? 40 years? Yeah. Not 40, um, so it was late 80s. But uh, but then there's villains too, like there's famous villains people like that are, you know, bigger, hefty people, you know, the Penguin, um, Kingpin, uh, the Blob, you know, and there's others. And the re there are multiple reasons for doing this. The first one obviously being aesthetic, People would prefer to look at attractive people rather than unattractive people, just as a general and universal rule of being a human. But not only... I... no? Right? That's not... <laughs> That's why you get, like, the villains that are all misshapen and all these other things like that, right? So it's not an aesthetic that everybody wants um, people to look like these characters do here, right? I know, people watch Sargon. Yeah, there, it's a lot of it's really pumped up and all that other stuff. But and a lot of it comes to what they were uh, basing uh, character designs and stuff on, right? So they were looking, like, that's why we have the goofy costumes, right? They were looking to circus performers and strongmen of, uh, of the time and stuff like that. Right? Yeah. Only that. There's a, there's a lot of implication in the fact that they have such good physiques. It implies that they are not just slobs who sit around at home doing nothing. It implies they train all day, every day. It implies they hone skills. It implies that they are working hard. And then It doesn't sound like he's read a comic book at all, right? Like, these people have these powers, right? They don't have... I mean, trying to understand and improve their control over some of these powers, right? That's some of the stories that'll come out with it. But it's not nothing to do with their physical physique, Right? That's none of that there is the training to, oh, we're going to be in tip-top shape to do all this stuff. They're, they're granted powers. You know, a lot of these, um, you know, whether you're a, a mutant or a mutate, so you're born with them, right? And uh, there's actually a whole uh, bit of comics they did uh, in the 2000s uh, called District X, where they look at uh, mutants that don't get the, the flashy, cool powers and stuff like that, where... You know, they get kind of really lame stuff. So those exist within the Marvel Universe as well, right? Yeah. Not just being layabouts, who are not honing their skills, who are not being heroic. It looks like they have a professional career in doing what they do. And that's important because it's, it helps you buy into the fact that they can do superior things. Because you're... So a professional career implies that they're paid to do this stuff. Now, I don't read a lot of um, modern stuff or modern uh, Marvel stuff or DC or anything like that just because I don't like the um, kind of the um, the reset every couple of years and all this other stuff where nothing sticks and it gets kind of stagnant and they, they kind of bring it back and forth. So it's like, it's not, I don't read it because it's that. It's like, you know, well... There's this cool new thing they're going to do, but in 12 months, 12 to 18 months, it's going to be gone, right? So, 
why bother with it? Why read it? Um, I tried getting into it uh, back when um, uh, the new Fifty Two and um, what was it? Uh, what was it that came out of um, um, Avengers vs X Men? I read that one. I thought it was a shit story, but you know, so I didn't. I didn't get into the whole uh, reset universe they were doing with it. But yeah. Um, but I mean, with that said, it's um. What I, I lost what he just said, so let me go back here. Are ...working hard, and they're not just being layabouts, who are not honing their skills, who are not being heroic. It looks like they have a professional career in doing what they do, and that's important. I mean, they don't have a pre professional career, I mean, for the most part. I know some in the, the modern comics and stuff with, like, the Superhero Registration Act and stuff like that, where they are contracted by the government. But for most of these guys, uh, characters in their creation, they especially go back... Uh, to all the things Stan Lee did, most of them didn't have um, professional careers as uh, uh, superheroes, right? The superheroes, the vigilante stuff they did outside of their other careers that they were working on. <laughs> well, what was their Marvel Now thing? That was kind of the light uh, reboot, or was supposed to be, coming out of Avengers vs. X-Men, Alhana. Yeah, yeah. They don't have, for the most part, these aren't government contracted uh, characters. Now they've played with that in more recent years, especially with Marvel. But I don't think that's the case with DC either. I mean, DC is pretty much uh, stock, um, old school. They have a uh, a day job, and then they go out and vigilantes at at night. Right. Because it's, it helps you buy into the fact that they can do superior things because you're expecting them to you know lift mountains and jump over this and fight bad guys you know that some fat schlub like me isn't going to be doing that you want someone who looks like they can accomplish this it i mean no these guys have superpowers right they things that are irrelevant to um their abilities and stuff like that right so if it's a character that's not super powered and has all these things um yeah, then you can probably get uh, the the expert training and all that other stuff that goes with some of the less superpowered ones, like Batman or whatever. If you want to do that way, but most of these people just have powers for who they are, right? Like, like I said, it bring you know, and Kingpin is a big schlub who, as far as I know, has no superpowers, and he throws Spider Man around who has you know super strength and all this other stuff, right? And he's you know bigger than you are, Carl. And then there's a um, a big gal. Um, that was a hero who has no powers that would beat up on superpowered ones. Uh, was a, a big pearl, or whatever. But oh, has it? Yeah. See, it, it's tough to get into um, all the the different stuff there. So um, that's that's another one of the big things that you know gets into these comics when you have you know fifty years of story that are all, or for the most part, canon. A lot of it gets retconned as with new writers and stuff, but. Yeah, so it's part of the it's part of the hard way to to jump into uh, some of this stuff. Um, but yeah, it's not. It's all part of what it is to be a superhero, and so we fast forward to now when Marvel have released the new New Warriors. And again, I have no connection. I don't care about this comic at all. But man, if I saw this, I would just be embarrassed. Like, do you think that these people are going to save you from anything? Do they look like they're capable and confident? I mean, look at the poses that they're in. You know, these guys are very confident. They're bursting out. They're, they're going to engage with whatever the whoever the enemy is. They're going to defeat them, and you can be sure of that. These people look like they might cry if I called them the wrong pronoun. And Kingpin looks fat. Listen. See, I don't know all the, the story with it. Like, so I see a lot of the, uh, the, the movies in the... Uh cartoon stuff is where I get most of my superhero stuff from, um, outside of, you know, like, the big, um, like, classic arcs that go on these big, uh, the big two stuff, you know, so, yeah, so Ahana's put me to shame here with it, um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's, you know, and the, the confidence and stuff here and showing all this stuff here, I mean, a lot of Marvel superheroes have, you know what Sargon would call pretty weak, um, um, what do I, what do I want to say the word? But um, um, you know, like he would say, oh, these ones look like they're gonna cry. They're not confident. They're not all this other stuff. And 
a lot of the Marvel superheroes is the um, uh, uneasiness, the um, lack of confidence that uh, characters have, and all these different issues, personal issues that they deal with that Sargon would probably consider weak, right? And he's going to mock these set of characters for, right? And I'm not making a joke about that. That's a real thing that this is about. But before we go into who these people are, let's have a look at the author. Well, the author is a one Daniel Kibblesmith, who had he had a, a bio written about him in the New York Times when he got married, and before he got married was featured in Elle magazine as one of one of their most uh, the 40, 40 most eligible bachelors of twenty fifteen. Now, the only people who get featured in these are part of people who are part of the network of, I, I guess we would call them left wing. Uh, cultural elites and that's what Daniel Kibblesmith comes from how he got there I don't know because I couldn't figure out who his dad was couldn't find it anywhere in fact but um, back in 2015 they did this bio on him and he apparently had written a book called how to win at everything and I think that this this winning streak of his might be coming to an end with this I don't think this comic's gonna sell <laughs> so I haven't read the the book here but uh, from what I understand he's a uh comedy writer generally he's written other stuff in comics um but uh, i imagine the how to win at everything uh, is a, a a bit of a comedy piece because he works for uh colbert on the late show he's a writer for him so i imagine part of that is a uh, um, you know a bit of a comedy thing with that book so he uh he, he said he lists his best trait as being, I come with my own pair of glasses. You do not need to provide glasses for me. Amazing. But anyway, he's written for BuzzFeed. He co-founded ClickHole. He, he's, he, he... Yeah, so ClickHole and stuff like that. I mean, that's probably part of it that goes... I don't know when ClickHole was founded, but... Um, you know, he's got a company and stuff like there. That's part of what gets you into those eligible bachelor things, is that you're a young up-and-comer making money and stuff like that. Right? Not this uh, left-wing cabal. Yeah, wish he had uh, copywritten uh, Safe Space, yeah. Yeah, we'll get into the names and stuff, like... He writes for all, all of the sort of, like, you know, insufferable left-wing outlets that you'd expect. And he's part of that network. He's part of that sort of culture. And so somehow he's landed at Marvel the the writing for the, the, the comic The New Warriors, and he gets to create the characters ascribe them their personalities and their motivations and on the marvel youtube channel they put up this interview it's had 167,000 views and 30,000 down so i figured that it might be just worth watching because this is honestly i, I again prepare yourself it is like a parody of, a, of an sjw done by an anti-sjw if it wasn't on the official marvel channel with nearly 14 million subscribers i would suggest that this was a joke i would think that someone had made this up my name is Daniel Kibblesmith, and I am the writer of New Warriors number one. I right. Look at the kind of man we're dealing with, right? I mean, Jesus Christ, Carl. Uh, this is uh, um, open and uh, uh, about a lot of his uh, kind of uh, biases and his uh, prejudices and stuff towards people and stuff there. He's not even trying to um, hide the stuff anymore. A little more cleverly and stuff uh, like he did a few years ago. Yeah, part of the social justice warriors. Yeah. This 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 guy doesn't relate much to these people, right? <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't want to be don't want to be blunt about it, but skin. I mean, I can't imagine you relate to those people very much either, Carl. I mean, I'm the you know like I was the athlete jock and all that stuff and all that training stuff here and. You know, I wouldn't even, you know, I'd be the one that's like, oh, this is the one that, you know, person's going to relate the most to these ones outside of, you know, the big bodybuilders, right? And it's like, most of the superhero characters I don't relate to, right? The characters I relate to are more the, uh, um, their um, regular life stuff, right? So that's the most interesting thing about, say, Peter Parker, for example, is all the troubles and um, things he does and has to deal with when he takes up... Um, you know, with great power comes great responsibility, right? And he becomes the um, superhero that way. So, in dealing with those responsibilities and stuff, that's relatable to me. Skinny guy, balding, mid-30s. 
tiny body, like you know, like hunched over, like not 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 someone who is physic, not not someone with a physical presence. He's not an intimidating man. He's probably yeah. And I'd make a general joke about the jock trade in superhero comics. That was the the '90s edge lord shit. That is, you know, the super edgy uh, thing that uh, was cringe as fuck then, and even more cringe looking back at it. You know, out of any of that stuff there. And, um, you know, it was basically people that took all the um, all the wrong things away from things like Watchmen and um, um, Dark Knight Returns and stuff like that, and those types of comics. Probably afraid of physicality, and he comes with his own pair of glasses, right? Okay. I want this guy designing comic book characters. I want them designing superheroes, because he's definitely going to describe superheroes that appeal to me, a normal person. I mean, have you looked at Stan Lee? I mean... Stanley was a bit better um, built kind of guy working in the military and stuff, but um, glasses, all that other stuff. I mean, he's not some peak idealized um, uh, person that was writing all the character. You know, is responsible for a good uh, good number of uh, uh, the characters in uh, comics today. I got interested in the New Warriors later. I remember seeing them on the shelf when I was a kid, picking up comics in the 90s, and just feeling like they were too cool for me. Like I was intimidated by, you know, Night Thrasher had a blade coming out of his wrist, you know. How on earth can you have such low self-esteem that you think a comic book is too cool for you? Like, what does that mean? Oh god, I can't read that. That's for cool people. That that's a cool comic book, and I, I'm I'm just not measuring up to the grade. Like, it's a comic book. It's not judging you. I mean, it's talk. He's talking about the characters, right? Like, you know. So these would have been '90s characters. Would probably fall into, like, I'm not familiar with there, but uh, would probably fall into a lot of the, uh, the super edgy. You know, you know, if you remember, uh, uh, Link Hara's character, the edgy '90s kid. When you'd come up and talk about some of these things, um, but he would look and say, "Oh, these super edgy guys and all this other stuff," and it's like, "That's not me. That doesn't, you know, fit there. There. That's the. If he thinks it was the cool, I don't know. It's a, it's a promo vid, and a lot of the shit they say there is um, marketing and stuff in these vids. So I don't know if that's actually there. Yeah, Jack Kirby's a dork, but he's, you know, awesome artist." Yeah, it's that kind of thing. That's something that just doesn't fit what uh, it's there. It's not the comic book that he can't pick it up and read it because, I mean, you know. But this is this is the man that we're dealing with here, right? The, the, the idea that there are comic books that are too cool for this man and he didn't dare read them. And for some reason, someone put him in charge of making the remake of the comic books that he was not cool enough to read. Carry on. I mean, he didn't say that he didn't read them, did he? of physicality and he comes with his own pair of glasses right okay i want this guy designing comic book characters i want them designing superheroes because he's definitely going to describe superheroes that appeal to me a normal person i got interested in the new warriors later i remember seeing them on the shelf when i was a kid picking up comics in the 90s and just feeling like they were too cool for me like i was intimidated by you know night thrasher had a blade coming out of his wrist you know how on earth we look at the yeah so i mean he's he read them and it was something that didn't fit him in the 90s that's fine i mean there's plenty of things that um you know i didn't get at the time when they were out and popular that um or i didn't like or didn't didn't appeal to me at a certain time that i've turned around and come back years later and said hey i like these things now right you know a lot of that would be um a lot of the uh, um you know, this would be more music stuff, but it would be a lot of the uh, 90s um, alternative, uh, especially the harder stuff that, you know, going on grunge and uh, alternative metal and stuff like that. Um, that wasn't for me at the time. Now I've come back and uh, I've, I've come to appreciate it more, you know, uh, appreciate those things now and those uh, bands and other stuff that I didn't when I was a kid at the time. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how you relate to, to a billionaire. Like, there's a whole bunch of things that are going to come here when we start talking about the character designs, just in comics in general. 
right? The things that he thinks are, oh, these are super cool characters, comic characters, you know, a guy that runs, a billionaire that runs around dressed up as a, a bat, you know, beating up people instead of using his immense wealth to fund programs to actually clean up uh, the city that he lives in, right? You know, it's it's a dumb thing. It's a character that you should not like at all, but, you know, he's one of the most popular characters in comics, right? And I like Batman. I like the stories and stuff there. So, But that's one of the uh, conceits I have to give away when reading those stories, right? You know, just like, um, you know, with me being a big Ninja Turtles fan, I have to give uh, some of the science uh, um, things that aren't real there. I have to give those up to read the story and enjoy the stories that are being told. It's kind of the conceit that said, all right, I'll live with it. The old sort of 90s ones. And if... I mean, that's Paragon of Virtue stuff. These these people look perfect. And, you know, they, they, it's a celebration of the human form. It really is. It's a celebration of the best of what a human can be in the arts. And it's, again, aspirational. And I would have thought that would have been good. That seems healthy to me. Anyway. For the night. I mean, that's a pretty weird, <laughs> pretty weird perspective, Carl, on your thing and what's healthy or not. Um, and it looks like that. And... Um, um, thing is, it's, you know, this kind of idolization over this stuff isn't really healthy, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of them that, that are created that way, right? Like, there's another one where, um, Children of Adam, um, has been getting a lot of backlash because they have new team characters that are all, you know, similar to... Um, the older characters and stuff there that are on the team, right? So they have a, a similar uh, Cyclops character as a team that's not... Um, oh my god, why am I, why am I forgetting um, Cyclops' real name? Um, oh, big blank here. Someone help me in chat. But uh, they have that there. Nightcrawler's uh, uh, got a smaller one and stuff. But they, they've done that forever, right? Like, all these characters. I mean, think of all the Bat family and stuff. Um, you know, Batgirl, Batwoman, all these other things that are based on it. Yeah, Scott Summers, there, thank you. Um, but yeah, so they have uh, these new mutants that are like that here. But, I mean, even in this one, this is Namorita, which is somebody that was uh, based off uh, Namor. I think is uh, I think is actually Namor's sister, if I got that right. Uh, the girl with the hijab was uh, uh, Dust, right? Because I don't think, I mean, the other, the other Muslim, the major Muslim one that's popular now is Kamala Khan, and I don't think she ever wears a hijab. She might uh, in her, um, in her day to day life, but uh, uh, she doesn't when she's Miss Marvel. But Dust does. Dust is uh, head to toe in um, either the it's more than hijab. It's not the niqab, but uh, something like that. Whatever the dress is there, but yeah. Nineties, as the as the cover said. New Warriors, I thought, were really interesting characters because they occupy this really cool space. They're forever young, but they've now been around for 30 years. My, uh... I hate that kind of reasoning. Oh, the, the, you know, the, it sounds, it sounds like hipster California intellectual, right? It's like, oh well, you know, these these warriors are young, but they've been around for 30 years. But the comics aren't like a documentary. They're not. They're not. Because you don't know when in time the comics are set. They're not. They're not just set. You know, they're, they're not a chronological documentary of the last thirty years. So it's not that they've remained forever young. It's that it's fiction. I mean, some characters do remain forever young, and some characters are allowed to age up. It's really weird. Uh, comic characters' ages and stuff. And a, it's part of my problem because I'd like to see some of these characters grow old, right? Become these grizzled veterans and all this other stuff instead of just some random far off future story or anything like that or some um you know an elseworlds or ultimate kind of thing where they're allowed to grow old right i think there's some interesting stories you can tell as they get older right it's um uh, you know like um take like batman beyond is where we get a uh, an older bruce wayne bruce wayne's kind of the ment um is still the mentor figure but uh currently with the young ones but he has a different role to the next batman I think that's a kind of a, a cool story to do with it and stuff. So I always loved the the Batman Beyond uh, series about a hypothetical world. Anyway, the editors on the the previous uh... yeah about changing with the time. I mean they do, and so it's always really weird. Like you read um, uh, 
you know, if you go back and read the stuff from the '60s where they have all this um, high high tech stuff, uh, but they don't have the things that we have in general day to day life now, right? And it's always kind of a, a weird contrast to that. Yeah. Oh, I loved I loved uh, old Bruce Wayne. Yeah, I went to the grandma, got married, all that other stuff. But some of them don't. Some of them are forever, like in that in their thirties. You know, you know, within like seven years or stuff like that. Which is really weird. Like you'll get you'll get uh, um, examples where. Um, uh, See, this goes, I don't have all the, the comic knowledge and stuff there. I just know uh, bits and beer. But uh, you'll have uh, these characters that, that are, like, in their 30s, the adults, and then there's these kids with them. But then, you know, 30, 40 years later, the kid's going to be, you know, in his mid-20s, stuff like that. But the adult that was on these adventures earlier is still in their early 30s, right? It's really weird how they do it. But part of that is they don't want to... Uh, get to a point where they stop writing Batman stories or Spider-Man or Superman or anything like that when the characters age out, right? Yeah. Yeah, like the older, the grizzled guy coming back there in um, um, The Dark Knight Returns and stuff, you know, which is Batman v Superman is taking some of that stuff from, um, is a really cool look at it. Books I've done like uh, Loki and Black Panther versus Deadpool asked if I'd be interested in doing a new Warriors tie-in that actually poses them as the authority figures in this conflict instead of the rebels. And I really liked the tension of that. So because the new war... Right, that, that's, that's really interesting. So the, the new warriors from the 90s have grown up, they've taken their positions in the institutions, and now we have the new generation. And this is Daniel Kibblesmith's opinion on the new generation, the, the young millennial types. Warriors are the authority figures in this story. They have to be mentoring new new warriors. Yeah, Robin the Nightwing. Yeah, I'd love them to age and stuff to go through. Like some of the best comics are the ones that um, let the characters grow and do all that other stuff. But the issue is, oh, you got to come up with a new new character to be able to write about, right? So, like I said, like I like um, the Hellboy universe and stuff there, and all the twists and turns and the aging and stuff with that in that book and all the different characters change, right? So there's uh, um, the, the girl that uh, Hellboy falls in love with um, is the same girl that uh, he saved as a um, baby from, um, oh, what are they? They're not fairies. What are they? Oh, it's been a while since I've read, read um, um, that particular issue, but... Uh, yeah, so he saved uh, saved her from there, and then, you know, 20 years later in the story, you know, 20 years in real life and stuff as they write the story along the timeline, he meets back up with her again uh, near the end of his story before he ultimately um, faces the Blood Queen and um, ends up in hell, you know, dead and in hell. And so there's, you know, and BPRD, which runs alongside that, just ended um, about a year ago now, the last issue came out. So there's no more... BPRD in the modern day, that story's done. But these comics companies want these characters that they can write about for 70 years, like Batman and Superman. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that's part of that's crazy thing with like he has a school, but there's no kids in there to, to train anymore, right? They've all grown up and they all age out. Warriors who are under 21 and uh, subject to the, the laws of it. And that's another good point, um, um, R&D. That's a, uh, um, it's a neat way to take these characters who were rebels as kids, right? I, I assume in the new warriors and stuff. And now they're the authorities, you know, through their, and that's part of the great thing about letting these characters age up is the different things along the path that they, 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 they take or how things change their minds. Stuff. Now, obviously they're all writing, but in story, those are interesting stories to see how their outlook on life changes and what they're going to do elsewhere, right? Triggered the outlook. I mean, how insulting is that? <laughs> if 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 your opinion of the old New Warriors was that, it's like, yeah, young people relate to this. Now young people will relate to this. <laughs> and we've only just begun on how bad these characters are. I mean, I don't get what, I mean, I think some of the designs and some of the suits are kind of, you know, you know, not the best, but I mean, 
Trailblazer looks pretty normal. I mean, outside of the the goofy gimmick, that shouldn't be a thing. Screen time, you know, looks fine. Um, you know, and even these suits, like, my biggest issue with the suits might be a bit of the uh, color palette choice and how um, um, stark it is and stuff there. But, I mean, you could do these suits as is um, and change the colors up and they look just fine as suits. No. <laughs> Carl can't grow at all. And this new law is making it illegal to be a vigilante under the age of 21. The artist on New Warriors... A new law that makes it illegal to be a vigilante under the age of 21. It's already illegal. You're not allowed to be a vigilante, regardless of your age. Why do they need a law for that? I mean, this isn't the real world, Carl. I mean, you can't, you can't argue that comics aren't the real world and then... Um, get upset at uh, uh, comic book laws or whatever and laws they put in place, right? It, within the universe that are affecting everything, right? Number one is Luciano Vecchio. He designed all of the new New Warriors and gave them costumes that felt as modern as the New Warriors costumes. To sort of... now, I can't comment on the art styles. I have no particular re frame of reference. I mean, yeah, and so part of, part of within the, that, with it not being illegal and stuff like there's, um, like, The Incredibles. One of the big things of The Incredibles was to um, look at and kind of de deconstruct um, um, why we let these superheroes cause all this damage with uh, the villains and stuff like that and their um, battles that way. And then they come back, you know, and, you know, they built the story around that. And those are some of the interesting ones that take, um, you know, you know, oh, we're okay with vigilantes breaking the law and doing all this. There's just like... No, in the real world, and now we get to like some of the crazy ones beyond just like you know a family film like The Incredibles to things like The Boys, where these superpower characters are fucking awful human beings, like horrible. But it's a deconstruction of what uh, these superheroes are and the, these tropes in general, right? And those are some of the more interesting, well-revered stories that last forever, right? No, he would love The Boys for all the wrong reasons, right? Just like you suggested, he would um, he would think uh, Rorschach is the hero, right? But I mean, I'm thinking of the old Slane comics that I used to read. And man, this looks like much lower effort than those comics. But I imagine those comics, you know, were like the pinnacle of art because you'll have to tell me a little bit about the Slane comics, Elhana. I think those might be a UK UK thing. Um, I'm not familiar with them. I think when I first watched this video uh, about two weeks ago, I looked up some of the art, and the art's cool. More kind of a, a realistic instead of the cartoony art we have here. Yeah, the whole, the whole, um, yeah. And that's the thing that's been, dealt, what, what when was um, Civil War? That was what, about 20 years ago? Maybe a little more than that? But I mean, that's a, a big story that has still made it into uh, the movies and stuff they were amazing so you know and the the alien vs predator comics were incredible as well but anyway i feel classic and instantly familiar so the first character that we're introduced to is trailblazer she's a group home and foster kid who is volunteering at a uh, senior center when this mysterious threat shows up at night threat but what portion of the of the population does that describe uh, a, a kid from a foster home who's uh, an orphan sorry from a foster home who's volunteering at a senior uh, health uh, center like a, you know old folks home and then this crisis so like i mean that's that's not what most people consider to be heroic or aspirational it's not that it isn't very very noble it is you know it, it's a very good thing to help out old folks when they need help I mean, just i mean this is the day job carl right this is my Carl doesn't read comics, right? Carl doesn't give a shit about superheroes, right? As like n knows nothing about the medium here. He's gonna treat there and stuff, but um, you know, seeing that these are all under twenty one, and I imagine are probably um, high schoolers, right? Um, I don't know about um, anybody else in chat, but uh, we had uh, volunteer volunteer requirements, right? As uh, high schoolers, to go over and. Uh, you know, we had to fill so many hours, right? Because uh, it looked good on applications for college and stuff like that. And so our schools required it so that we could build up that um, portfolio. 
And so there's plenty of high school kids that are doing, whether it's the old folks home, whether it's um, volunteering in different other community projects, right? So they, they try to get you involved and do all these other things. Yep, 2007 Civil War event. Yep, so yeah, not a little less than 20 years. But um, yeah, but I mean like the volunteering stuff there, I mean, that's perfectly fine, but that's going to be the day job, right? That's just like, um, you know, Batgirl, you know, back in the day was a, a, a librarian. Right, that was her day job, and then would go out and fight crime for no pay. Generally, but um, but that doesn't describe most of the population. That doesn't describe most young people's aspirations. That's not what they view. I think when they think of saving the world. I mean, it's not being put forward as saving the world, Carl. What the fuck are you talking about? This is the day to day life. This is like Peter Parker in high school kind of thing, right? It's no different here. And to this is, this is kind of the issue of trying to um, make criticisms every step of the way. and all oh, i got to fit everything into my narrative, and this is all wrong and stuff here, and we're going to uh, hammer home on why this is this and this and that, and everything is going to be uh, bad, right? There's no, there's no concession to the other side. And so it's interesting that you started there, someone who's f very fringe. It's a very fringe thing for young people to do this pressure runs to the rescue and because she helps him she ends up uh, in the crosshairs of this new outlawed law and she inherited from her grandfather a uh, magic backpack of divine origin we picked the name trailblazer because she's somebody who charges into action right a magic backpack of divine origin okay but that's not something she earned she just inherited it so she has accomplished nothing so i suppose just like every other fucking superhero that has powers, right? They don't accomplish anything. You know, Spider-Man's a spider bite, right? He didn't get that. He got, you know, some freak accident, right? Gave him powers, and he has to learn to deal with it, right? Superman was born, you know, uh, all the powers and stuff, and because he, you know, grew up under the yellow sun, he developed these superpowers that he wouldn't have had if he lived in uh, um, Krypton still. Um, so all this stuff is powers that aren't earned right outside of the you know the non-powered people that uh do do um crime fighting vigilante stuff right those are the ones that build themselves up to be those heroes yeah yeah a whole list we can list ca character after character after character that did not earn their powers did not earn all that other stuff and part of it is what do i do with these powers right so that's that kind of what splits you between a hero and a villain right what do I do? I have these new powers. What can I do? Do I act in my own self-interest? Do I, um, you know, take whatever I want because now I have the power to do the things? Or do I stand up for the people who don't have the power and defend them, right? And so that's your classic um, differentiation between a superhero and a supervillain, right? Is that you have the superheroes with powers that uh, do things um, to help those that are weaker than them and all this other stuff. I suppose it's probably fitting that you portray her as a woman... <clears throat> a young lady, sorry, who... <clears throat> it seems only fitting that she's portrayed as someone who doesn't look like she does huge amounts of exercise or spends a lot of time on self-control of their diet and things like that. And I'm not judging, I'm one of these people too. Carl, you're absolutely judging, right? You're saying those people can't be heroes, right? That's the whole thesis of your argument against this character is big people can't be heroes, right? It's dumb and there's art like there's plenty of other ones like uh, another one that comes to mind is uh volstag uh from the warriors three going all the way back to the 60s was a a hefty guy yeah it's about living up to the powers and great you know, responsibility and all that stuff yeah it, it was really um mind-blowing that this is his view of superheroes but uh you've got to face the facts that actions have consequences and Repeated action in one way gets the repeated consequence of the other way, of, of, that, of that result. And so if you're regularly being heroic and you're exercising, then you end up looking fit and buff. And if you're not, you don't. And then she gets given this backpack that's apparently a magical backpack that she can pull things out of. So what, what does he uh, think about like a character like uh, Big Bertha, who's um, what he would consider normal uh, woman, really, and her power is she you know balloons up to 750 pounds into this big uh and a, a big lady throws around and you know the bigger she gets the more powerful she has right so her power literally is um 
becoming fat, becoming huge, and all those other things, right? Um, to go beat up on uh, on air. So then, you know, with the magic backpack, there's nothing, you know, with her, it's her tech and her gadgets. And so someone who's more tech savvy can do, now this wouldn't be tech savvy with this character, but if you're designing a character that can be that way, they don't have to be the, you know, that uses like tech or anything else. They don't have to be, you know, these athletes or any stuff there. But if they're born with powers of super strength, like you look at um, Volstagg, Warriors 3, huge guy, big um, he's got muscles, but he's also got the huge uh, beer gut, you know, that hangs over. That you know, comically so. Yeah, knew it being here and all this other stuff, right? It's it, really weird how they want us fit. Oh, the SJWs are one of the SJWs doing all this stuff. That's not a superhero. Why does she, why is she necessary? Why can't she can't she give the pack to someone else who might actually be able to make some good use of it? But anyway, like, there's nothing. And we continue through. That's her judge. That's your judgment, Carl, on the on the character or on um, fat people in general. Is that they can't do anything, right? Give it to someone better. You're not good enough. All the, all these things you're saying you're not doing is exactly what you're doing, right? Super or heroic about this character. She knows that she can do some good with this, you know, mysterious gift that she's been given. Screen time is a internet kid taken to its sort of logical conclusion as a youth he was exposed to. I guarantee you he's not um, an alt-right Nazi, so I think you failed on that, uh, Kibblesmith. <laughs> right, that seems to be the logical conclusion of internet kids, or am I wrong? His grandfather's experimental internet gas. And I'll say right now, like I said, this is the bit I was talking about, right? It's not, this computer technology isn't some new and fanciful thing that you can, you know, where you can get away with doing stories like Tron. You know, was, when did Tron come out? Like mid-80s? <clears throat> so about 35 years ago now? You know, and even like um, the uh, um, last season of uh, uh, the 2003 Turtles cartoon where they put them into cyberspace and all that other stuff was dated and cringy. Like the internet gas is dumb. Right, that's a cringy thing here, but a it's not the first cringy thing in comics that I've done to, to grant people superpowers. So, you know, whatever you can get over it. It's one of those conceits you can give away with and go with the story. The story's good. That's internet gas. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> What's an internet gas? Oh god, this is the worst writing I've ever heard. Has patched him permanent. Yeah. Yeah, sumo, sumo wrestling should kick your, kick Carl's ass all over the fucking place. Throw him around. Um, we used to do, uh, um, you know, in spring practices in college or whatever, we used to do set up and do sumo matches between the offensive line and the defensive line uh, in college and stuff. And it's a tough thing to do, to throw your weight around and do that stuff just as a, a you know... No, there, but into the World Wide Web. The word screen time is only ever used in a sort of restrictive sense, and because we're doing a story about teenage rebels, uh, a lot of the names are about teens uh, fighting against labels that are put on them. So with screen time, so I've not heard the term screen time. I imagine that's just the amount of time you spend looking at your phone, probably used as some pejorative in some way. Why, why, why are we creating a character that owns this? Like, this isn't a superhero attribute. This isn't a virtue. Being constantly connected to the internet is not heroic, is it? Like, it seems like a curse, if anything. Like, it seems like downtime from the internet is a useful thing. But, okay, this is, again, highly patronizing. This is the aspirational end to this sort of, like, I don't know, Zuma uh, men? Zuma. It's nothing to do with aspirations, Carl, right? So... All that stuff you said before is why they named the character Screen Time. It's kind of a, a destigmatization. Now, I think the Screen Time name is uh, cringy, and I think it's what we'll find out his powers aren't, you know, as pretty cringy as a character and stuff there. But who knows? He may end up being a uh, a good character that gets developed well and all that other stuff down the line. But yeah, so I can look at these things and say, yeah, these are cringy and stuff here. But like the whole idea is to destigmatize um, some of these things, right? Like, so. Um, oh, you're always on your phone. Go out, play it in the yard, do all that other stuff. No, I think some cases you should go out and do all that stuff, but 
the whole idea is to amp up these things. And that's kind of what you get with superhero comics and um, fiction in general, is that you can amp up some of the things there beyond what is uh, actual, real, or applicable, and stuff like that. You can do this stuff there. Yeah. The boys? Like, sorry, lad, this is what you're going to be in this guy's mind. This is where you go. This is all you've got. This is the best you can do. You know, don't worry about saving the world. You're going to be an autistic kid on the internet. Welcome to the future. I mean, no, that's not what they're saying. That's not what anything there, right? It's all destigmatization, right? It's you saying all this stuff is bad, right? And I, don't, I wouldn't go talking about uh, what ultimately amounts to a good portion of your fan base. <laughs> I make try to make fun of them there and say, oh, that's the end there, but... We liked the idea that he has infinite screen time. Snowflake and Safe Space are the twins, and... Unreal! Have a good one, Rhett. I'll be on for a while, so if you got time and want to hop back in later, we'll still be going. I got quite a few videos to go through. Unreal! Again, if I were going to create a parody, it would look like this. Honestly, I, I mean... I, I just can't get over it. I just can't get over it. And you'll notice, again, like the, the reason I pointed out from the original New Warriors of how gendered they are to these ones now is that they are, of course, as degendered as possible. I mean, safe space is not degendered at all. Unless you think uh, pink is only something that uh, uh, girls and women can wear and it's not something that guys can do. But, um, no, I mean, he's still... Um, muscled and all that other stuff as a teen so i mean it's not gendered and then the um you know you can still see um what he would consider gendered for women and stuff like here even if uh, uh snowflake is uh non-binary right i mean some of that stuff is still there still there but um obviously someone who's non-binary isn't going to conform strictly to uh, these genders why is everything clicking in my ear It's like, um, it's like Discord is still running when it shouldn't be running. Quick clicking in my ear. There we go. Um, and things like that, but, I mean, like I said, the color design and running, like, the pink through to the eyes, the hair, and all this stuff here, and running the blue all out there. I don't like that um, design as well. Like, you could clean this up and make the um, suit less um, kind of like a color swap and more personalized and things with their power and still kind of build off this base and make it work. So that'd be my criticism of the, uh, the art and the design of the characters in general. Yeah, getting a lot of Discord action. And I, I had it closed, so I don't know why I, was, why I was going off. But So yeah, I don't like the design. Now, the names... I'll say right here, Snowflake and Safe Space are not the worst names to have as a superhero, right? We can go through the list of really bad names uh, for superhero that far outclass these guys here. Now, are they the best names? Um, I saw someone on YouTube talking about this thing uh, who did a redesign and changed the names to Hail and Haven, which might be, you know, some people might think are cooler names um, and make more sense there. Um, the, the part that uh, drives the cringe a bit is why they chose snowflake and safe space right so it's not like oh um we're gonna make a person who has uh defensive abilities right create shields and all this other stuff here so we're gonna call them safe space right or someone like snowflake you know so like their power sets make sense with the names that they've chosen but they they designed those power sets to fit the names and pick the names as uh um for the specific purpose but i mean that's comics with how you name your characters how you theme your theme everything Right? And stories in general. So you can tell the stories that you're trying to tell. Oh. But, like, if you want to take um, real bad names, like Major Maple Leaf, right? I think it's a pretty pretty bad name. Um, calling a superhero Puck. Your safe space is Bubbler. Uh, not only are the, the blue and the pink reversed, so the girls wearing the blue, the boys wearing the pink, but the general, I mean, you know, you can say, well, this one's more muscular. Yeah, but it look at the face doesn't necessarily look more manly could this could be a muscular woman or and this could be a sort of feminine boy the whole point is to 
erase these borders and boundaries, erase the standards, and make sure that essentially nothing rises above the rest. But honestly, putting a fucking snowflake and oh, a safe space, like, it's so cringe. It, uh, like, I can't understand, I can't, I can't fathom what level of irony I must be on to still be enjoying this. Because <laughs> I still find this funny. Like, the idea that this person exists and this media has been paid for and Marvel are actually willing to go to the wall for this because this is not going to sell. Like, no one is going, oh yeah, my favourite superhero is Snowflake. <laughs> but I did like Safe Space as well. <laughs> like, there's nothing heroic about this. These are anti-heroic attri attributes. These are not things that people aspire to. I mean, I don't get the anti-hero attributes. I mean, anti-hero is a pretty well-defined character, and these obviously aren't going to be, or I assume aren't going to be anti-heroes. Um, they'll be even, you know, breaking the law to do the right kind of thing, like, uh, you know, Captain America in the film universe. Their names are very similar to screen time. It's this idea that these are terms that get thrown around on the internet that they don't see as uh, derogatory to take those words. Yeah, but to not see them as being derogatory is to say that we are actually weak and feeble, right? That they are insults directly designed to attack your courage and your fortitude and your resilience. The, these are, the, if you need, if you were... What is that nonsense, Carl, right? You think anybody, so this is the hypocrisy in... Uh, people like Carl and um, the anti-SJW stuff, right? So you have all the anti-SJWs um, screaming about this online, like, oh my God, the SJWs are ruining this, all this, you know, being their definition of what a snowflake is, right? And things like that. And there's ways you can take, you know, snowflake can mean other things in there. And safe space was something that you took was a term that was used to um, help people that needed stuff, and he turned it into a derogatory term, right? It's like, oh, you want to go run into your safe space and all this other stuff, and it's like, Carl, this is your safe space, right? With all your um, shitty followers and things like that and the audience you built. I mean, this is your safe space to say horrible shit and not face any repercussions for the most part. If you're a snowflake and you need a safe space, I don't want you fighting some supervillain I don't think you're capable of doing it because the supervillain might misgender you or something. And that would... <laughs> I, I just... Why don't they understand? But I mean, or they can make character... You know, they can make quote-unquote SJW characters and you'd fucking lose your mind and go crawl into a fucking hole, Carl. Right? I'll, I, like I said, watch uh, the Fourth Ages channel. He goes through all of this in, in great detail. He does a very good job of examining progressive uh, morality when it comes to heroism. Very, very good. And kind of where so I went and watched um, this uh, channel that he mentions up, and so they link back to a quote from a few years ago, um, and they lie about what the quote's for, right, and what uh, or what the quote meant, right. So they 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 um, restated it, paraphrased it when there. Oh uh, yeah. Well, let's have a look. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, those are nice. That's in uh, um, City of Heroes, isn't it? Uh huh. Wear them as badges of honor. Safe space is kind of a big, burly. You know, and it's no different than kind of like um, um, how some people will walk up and say, Yeah, I'm an SJW, right? So th think of uh, my friend um, Jangles. You know, he goes by Jangles Sad Lad, um, but he also goes by. Or he did early in his thing. Um, still uses it as his Twitter handle, but SJW debates, right? So they wear it and stuff. You're like, you know, you create all these things of, oh, these SJWs are this, 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 and that in one group to demonize, you know, that that out group. And people are like, no, I'd be everything that's uh, an SJW and stuff there. Uh, we're just looking at uh, Carl's uh, take on the new warriors, right? So. Moist, uh, moist master. Um, nothing big here, but it's just you know, 
there's a bunch of different videos I could have picked to talk about it, but some of the other ones that I would have liked to have done it on uh, weren't quite as in-depth um, as Carl and kind of things he says. Uh-oh. Oh, I just wrong thing. Sort of stereotypical jock. He can... Oh, yeah, stereotypical jock. Looks just like a stereotypical jock. Create force fields. I mean, outside of the pink hair and stuff, you know... And the stereotypical jock obviously references, you know, kind of who he is as a character and stuff. So, but I mean, I don't know. I didn't play any stereo. So this, this is kind of the weird uh, world that uh, Carl lives in. Um, that just doesn't ref reflect reality. Now, this is my personal experience. So it's an anecdote. It's not anything and stuff there. But I mean, we had the stereotypical jocks that um, we had uh, dress up days in high school. So or usually around a homecoming week. And so we had a, a Glitz and Glam day. Well, and so what that was was for basically, um, or what, you know, you, you dress up fancy and all this other stuff, and that's Glitz and Glam day. But uh, what it meant was uh, um, the guys would all wear their older sister's dresses or whatever, you know, like fancy dresses to school, or they would, uh, if they were into it, they'd go and get... Uh, um, Go to go Goodwill and stuff and find something on the cheap, and then they they do a whole fancy thing with like they would rent a limo and stuff and do something crazy there. But they'd spend the day running around in their sisters' dresses for anything, and they were the stereotypical jocks, right? So it's kind of kind of weird, like oh, getting all upset because of uh, pink hair or whatever, right? No bullshit is repetitive. Like his is, you know, at least Carl when talking about Carl, it's um. Uh, He'll go and try to form a point anywhere there where no bullshit is, here's a talking point, you know, here's another talking point, here's that same talking point that went there, and he'll stop it at 10 minutes, right? It just drives me insane to try to talk, to respond to a no bullshit video. Whereas this here, there's different things he's said along and different uh, claims he's made that I can talk about, and which is what I like, you know? I was hoping for um, geeks and gamers and um, some of those other people to have decent videos on this to talk about um but yeah they weren't really decent they were kind of unhinged you know angry you know just rant videos right and i could have taken some of the you know other maybe like shoe on ahead and responded to hers but hers isn't um like hers is like oh this is cringe this is oh here and it's uh uh i'll be it's fine to think some of this stuff is cringe i think plenty of the stuff with these characters are cringe and kind of out of touch and all that ever things, but I mean, that hasn't changed. That's always been the case when they try to do these kind of heroes. I mean, you could go back and look at, you know, each decade and see all this stuff and see the same kind of cringe, right? But he can only... Yeah, yeah, it's, you know, like the quartering is kind of the, the rant there. And it's like, oh, 100,000. Like, he's made three videos on this topic. I think he made a fourth recently. Um... But it's like, it's not, you know, I'm not going to go through like 40, you know, 40 minutes of the thing to grab the 10, 12 points or whatever that he might have to talk about. Like, I think his most recent one on this is talking about because Diamond has paused um, uh, distribution of new comics for the foreseeable future. That uh, that's going to hurt the comic book industry. And then he tries to wrap it around and blame it on like the new Warriors or the... Um, what is it, the Children of the Atom or whatever the new one is with the new X-Men team or the new uh, Teenage X-Men team um, as being things that are ruining it. But, you know, I did a video on, um, well, not much on it, but he was in it part of it, my response on, like, the Jenica mutation last summer uh, and the response on my channel. If you want to see a recorded one where I just go through, it's like, yeah, these people don't read what they talk about and it's just awful. And it's like the... The one that they still bring up is, like, Lady Thor, which, from other people that I've heard, is Lady Thor, outside of some cringy dialogue and stuff like that, was generally a pretty awesome run. You know, I've heard that from, you know, Vadim. Um, Sofane has said uh, the same. And so, and I think even, like, Sofane's, you know, conservative uh, uh, partner, um, Fat Pat, said the same thing, that it was a, it was a good run, right? So it's, like, it's outrage bait to... You know, make money. 
because he did a video a few weeks ago where he was complaining about, oh no, YouTube's trying to hide it. Oh, I'm going to lose all my money and stuff here. But it wasn't really that. And it was all the, all right, everybody go in, turn that bell on so you get the notification. Share this out to everybody to make sure that your YouTube's trying to censor. You know, it was basically, hey, push my stuff and lift me up in the algorithm again. And we'll run through here because it's not making enough money. Trigger them if he's protecting somebody else. Snowflake. Why? Why is that? Oh, is it because that you like think okay, the big person should be the protector of the little person, but not have to worry about themselves because they're not people who suffer, and because that makes it sound like they're not go they're, they're going to be always good. I think. No, that's no. This is Carl's narrative that he's got to try to fit into everything. This is why I watch these videos as he's tried to, you know, as he, he takes that second look. Hmm, how can I fit this into my narrative that um, the SJWs are real bad and stuff here? It's like, no, it's just a power set that has a weakness, right? They don't, people don't want um, every superhero to be Superman, you know, where they have to come up with some pretty um, crazy ideas to make his, you know, his over his overpowered nature uh, weakened, right? So, he, he weakened, so you have the different kryptonites and stuff like that to use against them. <clears throat> this is just like, all right, you have this range of power here. This is where you're weak. And so they can put them in a team dynamic and they sort and help each other out. Or as they move around or they have to work together and stuff there. Right? It's That's all it is. But I mean, you know, tell us what the big jock thinks, Mr. Kibblesmith. Because non-binary and goes by they, them. Snowflake has the power to generate individual crystallized snowflake-shaped shurikens. The connotations wow. of the word snowflake in our culture right now are something fragile. And uh, this is a character who is uh, turning it into something sharp. Snowflake is the person who has the more offensive power, and Safe Space is the person who has the more defensive power. The idea was that uh, they would mirror each other and compliment. And what on earth is this pose? Like, brothers and sisters don't touch like this. They just don't, that's weird. Really weird and really creepy. But again, notice the deliberate inversion of gender roles there. Complement each other. I don't get how that's an inversion inversion of gender roles. Yeah, Cyclops and Havoc have uh, are immune to each other. Yeah, everybody's got um, different limits on their powers. I mean, that's kind of the um, kind of the point, right? This is it would be if they came out and Safe Space and Snowflake were basically um, Superman, right, with almost no. No, uh, um, no weaknesses. What would Carl be screaming? Oh, SJW Mary Sue, SJW Mary Sue. It'd be Ray all over again, right? In his mind. So there's no winning with these people. Um, they're going to find every way to twist anything you say into um, the evil SJW narrative. B negative is the goth kid. When he was a baby, he got a rogue life-saving blood transfusion, we assume, from Michael Morbius. And now he has a very similar look. Oh, this, this is just cringe. And very similar vampire powers. B-negative also is obviously a pun. It's a blood type, uh, which is great for a vampire character. And it's also a proud ownership of the idea of having a bad attitude. I want the people... Proud ownership of the idea of having a bad attitude. Why would you want to be proud of having a bad attitude? Again, is that virtuous? It seems like it's not virtuous by design. And you're like, okay, here you go. Here's, here's, a, here's a hero who's not virtuous. In fact, they're proud of doing something that we would consider to be anti-virtuous. Something we would consider to be... I mean, maybe. Um, this comes to kind of how they draw, you know, these more cartoony style... Just how they draw um, young kids. There's very few lines that you can do without uh, emphasizing it. You know, but um, his... Uh, oh, what did I miss here? Oh, the, the bad attitude thing. I mean, there are plenty of characters that are bad attitudes and all this other stuff that are like... like the anti-hero genre exists as it is, right? Like... Wolverine's got a pretty bad attitude, and he's a well-loved character. You know, and stuff like that. Or you got the Punisher, you have um, Deadpool, right? These kind of anti-hero characters that don't have all this thing. It's like, oh, you made a character who's proud of being 
uh, negative or bad attitude, you know, kind of thing. And what he probably means by the bad attitude is kind of like punk rock thing, right? Um, you know, given the design of uh, uh, be negative and stuff, it's probably all it is. Yeah. In a demonstrable negative. It's part of his superhero persona. Great. Just great. Uh, like, honestly, I'm amazed at how how they drag the standard down to uh, 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 like way further than i thought it could go i deadpool punisher wolverine go on and on and on right these characters exist i mean this was kind of the um in general the, the big revolution or what came out of um I mean, wolverine's earlier that's made a bad attitude but i mean this is kind of the 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 rise of the anti-hero in the 90s you know was a big thing, like if you've read comics. Um, and not even being someone who was a big comic reader until relatively recently in the last 10 years because I lived in bumfuck nowhere uh, and didn't have a comic shop growing up. Uh, so I only saw that stuff on TV, but like Wolverine, the big badass and stuff like that, that was... Thanks, Mr. Yeah. I didn't think you could get super... Hmm. There we go. Thanks, Elhana. Let's get you. My normal mods aren't in here today, so we'll... How do I do this? Mod user. There we go. Alright, we'll go back here. We're almost done with this video. Then we'll go into the iDubs drama, and then I have a couple other videos. Uh, more deep intellectual thought to get into. The heroes that would be this shit at being superheroes. I know that from all kinds of plot conveniences and contrivances, they will win the day every day and they will always, always be successful. But my God, man, you know, the, like, I don't believe that these people are going to be good as superheroes. I do believe that the other ones were good as pe uh, might be good as superheroes because of what they were. Anyway, carry on. People who read our New Warriors to feel all of the excitements that they felt uh, if they read the 90s. And I'm pretty sure Night Thrasher, just from his name, his design, and some of the stuff he uses, that he's probably pretty one of those um, more of the kind of anti-hero types. Maybe not quite as much as others, but just from the name, the design, and stuff, and some of his different things, that he's kind of that badass without, you know. No, he doesn't at all. No, he said he read, he read what, um, was it 2000 AD, Alien vs. Predator, and Slain were his things, but yeah. He doesn't read any of the shit he talks about, right? So he'll complain about the SJW infestation all day, and he's just wrong. This one, we want it to have big, colorful characters. And it also ignores that uh, comic books in general, superhero comics especially, have long been um, an SJW thing. You know, would be fit as an SJW thing, right? So like the X Men being a um, an allegory for um, you know just about any oppressed minority group. Right? Mutants and stuff like that. That's been a long standing thing. Personality clashes, uh, romance, a uh, diverse cast, which is. I'm sorry, this is just so funny. Like, it, it really looks like the millennial interpretation of this is shite. I mean, it, like, genuinely shite. Like, it looks like first worldism actually it because like the the original characters most marvel characters are formed from some form of suffering right they they go through trials when they're young and these things are physically difficult and they come out being superheroes these people don't look like they've been through any kind of um no that is like no like what the fuck this is this is carl that doesn't read comics right doesn't read comics at all yeah, race relation stuff, you know, with Professor X being uh, MLK and uh, Magneto being uh, Malcolm X, um, different things. Yeah, so there's plenty of that stuff in there. Um, but, like, this, no, they don't get their powers from struggle, right? The the um, the struggle comes after they get their powers, you know, 90% of the time. You know, it's, you know, Peter Parker gets his powers, goes, 
um, Bees a bit selfish. Oh, I'm going to go make some money with it and all this other stuff. And, you know, I didn't stand up to the, the thief that ran out with the money. And because I didn't stand up, my uncle died, right? And so now I have this power to stop the bad people from doing things, right? So that's the struggle. He already had his powers, right? He didn't develop his powers. He didn't do any of that stuff um, because of that. And the, the, the struggle was, um, oh, shit, I can stop things. I have the power to stop things. Now I'm going to step up and defend the little guy, right? And then part of uh, his, uh, his continued struggles is that um, how does he deal with uh, life as a vigilante when he uh, has all these uh, villains that come after him and all this stuff? And how does he protect his family, right? And so that's, you know, creates some relationship things where he pushes away Mary Jane at times and uh, trying to protect uh, Aunt May and all that other stuff, right? That's the struggle of him being the hero. It's not um, some kind of uh, aspirational thing, the kind of things he gives up. That's his struggle. That's his sacrifice having physical trials especially not the fat girl at the front like this this looks like the privileged sons and daughters of people from beverly hills who are like larping as superheroes and i'm not i gotta imagine that's a shot at vosh right there the beverly hills comment um very much sounds like a, a shot at vosh surprise i this is not gonna sell i do not think this will sell something that the new warriors titles i mean it probably won't sell a ton like it probably won't hit i think what's marvel's cutoff point it's like forty thousand issues you got to be above i don't imagine it's going to stay above 40 issues very long anyways but most of their books don't stay above forty thousand issues anyway even with their a-list characters right so this will probably sell you know decently um for the number one issue as a collectible right but then it'll eventually decline over time but that's every single comic book Right, there might be something in the middle that'll uh, or some big event or anything like that that might prop it up if it's a long running one. So like uh, the Ninja Turtles comics from IDW that I read, um, they had a pre you know with the Jenica mutation back there all the way through um, um, 101, they had best the comics has ever sold, right? Because it you know hit the 100 milestone, which was the best selling issue they ever had, um, and there's a bit there, but now it's kind of steadily drop back off to its uh, regular reading rate that it has been. It's been moving closer in that direction now. I think it's about you know 15,000 issues now, which is up over what it was before the Jenica thing, but uh, it's settling right back around around 15,000 um, issues sold a month. So, I mean, that's just how comics go. So I've always strived to make a priority. Every New Warriors comic has always felt like a reflection of the, the year that it came out. And Yeah, that you know, the biggest reflection there was that Night Thrasher um, drawing. Right there, the, the skateboard, the you know what is that design as a suit? That's the um, the nineties um, extreme edge, extreme cool kind of thing um, laying right in there. So I mean it the original book wasn't uh, immune to the things that you can look at and say, "Oh, this is cringe. This is why. What are you doing about some of the aspects of these new characters, right?" So, and it's always going to exist going forward, just the way it is. Uh, I don't think we're worried about being dated. I think we're way more interested about it being now. I agree with that. I think that the the comics are a reflection of the era in which they're produced, and I think that this just tells us a huge amount about the self-confidence of young people in the 90s to the self-confidence of young people now and the question is well what's changed what has affected these people and i think that one i mean the difference in the comics has nothing to do with self-confidence of young people i mean jesus christ i mean was we had grunge in the early 90s as a music scene as a kind of a pretty depressive uh kind of uh, lashing out um youth culture thing right like there wasn't the self-confidence there in kids, you know, that you think was there because, oh, the New Warriors is um, big bad stuff. No, it was going with um, uh, trends of what they thought were cool. Like the Night Thrasher design is very 90s, right? You know, and his sets and all that other stuff, you know. And it's a lot of stuff people look back and say, that was bad. You know, it's not, not quite uh, uh, Rob Liefeld bad, you know, with his designs and stuff. But let's see, we were almost done here. Uh, see this last couple of lines, and we'll go on to the next one. One of the one of the one of the problems is the attack on things like gender roles and standards. I think that when you give people these sort of aspirational things to try and aim for, 
and they're, the method by which to achieve them seems to be self-evident, which is exercise and practice, then there is a, there is a confidence that you can get there, or at least get halfway and make make, you, make yourself better than you were. You know, feel proud of yourself. But what do these people look like they feel proud of? Like the incestuous brother or sister, the autistic kid who's tied to the internet, the fat girl who's never done anything, doesn't have any superpowers at all, or some weirdo vampire cringe. Like, there's nothing aspirational there. It's really, really pathetic. And this... I mean, okay, boomer. Um, this is uh, uh, this is what I talk about with Carl. Like, he's going to say, oh, freedom, do all this stuff, and everybody can do this, and... Um, Put your own things in comics. You know, this is a new title, new characters, everything. They should be fine with it, right? But it's oh no, it's you know, it's they'll, they'll, they'll pretend like you can make your new characters, do all this other stuff. Um, but um, anytime there's women or diversity, oh, it's forced diversity. The SJWs are ruining this and all this other stuff. It's like, dude, you said you said the longest time, like in the Gamergate days, you know. Make your own stuff. Make your new things, right? And that's what Marvel's doing. These are a new set of characters, right? It's not picking up a mantle, which, I mean, it's fine. You can pick up a mantle and do that stuff, even though they'll bitch about it now. There's a cottage industry to bitch about um, if a new character picks up the mantle for a short period of time. But, I mean, that's a long-standing uh, comic book thing. Alrighty. Yeah, he just doesn't get comics, right? Like... There's certainly cringe aspects about this that are going to look real dated and real, like, ugh. Bad here is someone who's older trying to, you know, it's like, hey, my fellow kids, um, the Steve Buscemi um, uh, sketch, right? But, I mean, that's going to be comics forever. Going forward, it's been comics in the past. Now, some of the things that stick out that don't look dated or anything like that become the new trends of the future, right? So, all right, that's it on that one.